I, I, I want to engage for just one minute in some shameless self-promotion. Uh, the website is, is very, very gratifying to me. It was, uh, I won't go into the long history now of the website, but uh, it is essentially a work in progress, and it will always be in progress because history is constantly expanding. And as many of the people in this room know, I've been recruiting them to try to write for the website. And I will continue to do that because it is a huge resource in African American history, and particularly global African history. Uh, we started it with, the, with one idea in mind. How do we get African American history out of the classroom and into the general public? Uh, how do we make sure that anyone with a computer can have access to African history? And the answer, uh, is, is Black Pass. This is a 10,000 page resource. It has all kinds of information that will be useful to you. I'm making a shameless plug here. It will be useful to you in all of your classes. So please take down the URL. Please look it up when you get back to your dormitory rooms. Most importantly, please use it because this is by far the largest source on African American history on the internet today. Okay, folks, our presentation is, is actually on, on uh, obviously, uh, the border of Kansas and Missouri, which is a very, very powerful lesson in history to all of us. And you guys are very much part of, well, at least you're descendants uh, of that history. I, I'm staying, I'll get to the lecture in a minute, but I'm staying in the Eldridge Hotel. And I don't, I don't know how many of you know that the Eldridge Hotel was burned twice. Uh, in the history of, of Lawrence, Kansas. And that burning, those burnings, go right to the heart of what I'm going to talk about today, the struggle for freedom along this border. And a lot of people, not just black folks, a lot of people paid a heavy and indeed a terrible price because there were those who wanted to gain freedom and those who wanted to help them gain freedom here in the city of Lawrence. So you also live in a historically significant place, and I, I want you to realize that. I want to look at this, this afternoon at the Kansas-Missouri border as the fountainhead of African American history. I think I can say this without contradiction. There's no other state in the Union whose history as a state, as a founding, founding state, is so tied to African American history the, uh, and African American people. And I can argue, I think, with complete and other confidence, especially after the conversations I've had today, that there's no city in Kansas that's more tied to that history and the notion of African American freedom than the place we're in right now, Lawrence, Kansas. But I'm going to begin our story not with Lawrence, Kansas, although there are images of Lawrence that are all around. This is the John Brown mural, which is in Topeka. How many of you have seen this mural? Okay, okay, so we're in a, in a friendly place here. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to start not with Kansas. We're going to end with Kansas, but I'm going to start with essentially a look at the entire West because most people in, in America, and I dare say probably most people in this, in this room, are not familiar with the great debates that were going on about slavery in the West. We, we obviously know about Bleeding Kansas because we're here, but I would suggest to you that Bleeding Kansas was one end of the spectrum, and that spectrum included a number of other places in the West. I want to talk then, not necessarily about Kansas first. We will get to Kansas. I want to talk about areas farther east, farther south, and farther west, because all of those places had a role in the, in the debate over slavery. Few historians link slavery to the West, yet this region's claims of innocence on this question are muted by the presence of black bond servants in every state and territory in this region, every state and territory in the West. Indeed, before 1865, most English-speaking African Americans who came to the West were involuntarily, involuntary migrants. They came as slaves. Texas is the grand example of this. Uh, Texas had 182,000 slaves in 1860. To put that in perspective, one out of every three Texans in 1860 was in bondage. Let me, let me repeat that. One out of every three Texans in 1860 was in bondage. And of course, you can see this quote from Texas Judge C.A. Frazier. You're going to see a lot of quotes like this on the nature of slavery in Texas. And notice how he ties slavery, the concept of capturing black slaves, to the concept of, that, that's very much Western, the concept of capturing wild horses on the prairie. Slavery was well entrenched in Texas by the 1840s, 
However, and this is probably something you don't know, smaller numbers of slaves were transported involuntarily to other states and territories, including California and Oregon. Look, look at this slide, former slaves in the Indian Territory. And the Indian Territory had a significant number of slaves. The black slaves were probably 10% of the people in the Indian Territory. And of course, there's Utah and Oregon Territory. As I said before, there's no corner of the West that didn't grapple with the institution of slavery. There's no corner of the West that didn't have slaves at, at one time or the other. Uh, even today, it's hard for us to imagine slaves in California. Even today, it's hard for us to imagine slaves in California. Let me give you an example. There were slaves in Berkeley, <laughs> okay? There were slaves in Berkeley. And fortunately, there were abolitionists in Oakland who freed them. So this business of slavery is somehow or another an Eastern or Southern institution is just simply wrong. Slavery existed everywhere. There's an old argument that among, his, among historians that there was the so-called natural limits of slavery, and that natural limit was the 98th meridian, which is almost at the crease on this map, on this very old map. But let me suggest to you that the 98th meridian may have, been, may have represented the farthest advance west of slave-based plantation agriculture, you know, cotton, uh, obviously sugarcane and the like, uh, as it was practiced in the South, but it does not pose an insurmountable barrier to the development of the servile institution in the West. Let me give you an example from my area of the, of the West, the Pacific Northwest. This is Oregon, Oregon Territory in 1857. And I would suggest to you that we, while we talk about bleeding Kansas, Oregon came very close to having its own civil war. While we talk about bleeding Kansas, uh, California came very close to having its own civil war, internal civil war. In other words, slavery was going to be hotly debated all over, all over the West. As Allen's comments attest, the slavery question loomed large over the Oregon Territory. As a matter of fact, it was the most important question debated at the time of statehood in Oregon. It was the most important question uh, debated. Uh, this is, this is a situation that a lot of people don't necessarily realize, but it's a, it's a situation that sort of lays the groundwork for our discussion of uh, Kansas. Kansas represents not just an anomaly in the sense that there is the fight going on here. It represents, if you will, the largest struggle that's going on over who's going to control the West. This is my basic argument about the West. The North is already free by 1860. The South is clearly committed to slavery by 1860. There's one grand prize, and that grand prize is all of this territory. Will this area be in the slave or, or open to slavery? Will this area be open to freedom? That was the debate that was going on in Congress, and it's the debate that was going on in every state and territorial legislature uh, in the West at that time. So the West is not somehow another, apart from the story about slavery, the West is central to the story of slavery. The West is the grand prize in the conflict between the North and the South. And the question was always, to what extent would slavery be allowed in the unsettled West? Well, there were a number of people who had interests here in, in that question, and I'm gonna discuss one group, African Americans, because they had their own answer. African Americans would resist slavery, and when I say African Americans resisting slavery, I mean both free blacks and enslaved blacks in every territory in the West. Afri Let me repeat that. African Americans would resist slavery in every territory in the West. Let me provide an example of, of that resistance. This is a man that you have not heard of. I, I assume you have not heard of. This is George Bush, not the president. This is another George Bush. Jo huh? George Bush. George, B <laughs> uh, George Bush was an African American. Actually, he was from Clay County, Missouri. Anybody here from Clay County, Missouri? Okay, and how far is Clay County from here? An hour, an hour. He was from Clay County, Missouri. He was a prosperous African American. He was an African American farmer. He was interracially married. He was married to a white wife. But nonetheless, as a free black farmer in Missouri, he knew that his prospects were limited, and cer certainly the prospects of his children were limited. And so as a result, George Bush, I call him my George Bush, 
uh, left Clay County and made his way on the Oregon Trail in 1844 all the way out to the Willamette Valley, or at least to the edge of the Willamette Valley. Um, and I don't know if you can read all of this, but this is John Minto describing George Bush. And the key phrases here, I'll just read them to you. The first key phrase is George Bush telling Minto in 1844 along the Oregon Trail, I should watch when we get to Oregon what usage is made or awarded to people of color. And then Bush said later, if I cannot get a free man's rights, I will seek the protection of the Mexican government in California. In other words, understand that the Mexico began at the Oregon, what is now the Oregon-California line, uh, and George Bush was committed to the idea of actually moving south into Mexico, into California, in order to be, in order to be a free person. He didn't have to do that. He came to uh, the border, the Columbia River, between Washington and Oregon, and even though theoretically all of this area was the Oregon Territory, he decided to move to the north. He decided to move north of the Columbia. And in the process of moving north, other people would follow him, and eventually in 1853, a new territory would be born, a new territory would be created, and it would be Washington Territory. My suggestion here is that without Bush, Without George Bush, there might not be a Washington Territory. In other words, George Bush was crucial to that story. But George Bush is also crucial to our story of the resistance to the institution of slavery uh, in, in the West. So the Bush family, the Bush uh, people reach uh, a place just outside of what is now Olympia. As a matter of fact, they reach it before there is Olympia. And they create Bush Prairie. And George Bush becomes and remains the largest and most prosperous farmer in Washington Territory for a number of years. George Bush is allowed to vote. George Bush is allowed to keep his land, the land that he homesteaded, uh, and, and because of the role that he played in establishing Washington Territory. Unfortunately, unfortunately, these rights are not extended to other African Americans at that time in Washington Territory. Sometimes the resistance to slavery means literally running away. And here I'm going to give you another example from the Pacific Northwest. This is the example of Charles Mitchell. Charles Mitchell was a 14-year-old slave boy from Olympia, Washington Territory. Notice what I said, slave boy from Olympia, Washington Territory. He was enslaved in a territory that theoretically was supposed to be free. Charles Mitchell was owned by Major James Tilton of Olympia, the Territory Surveyor General. And in 1860, on September 29th, 1860 to be exact, the boy stole away on an American steamer, the Eliza Anderson, bound for Victoria, British Columbia. As the steamer was underway, Mitchell was discovered uh, by the ship's officers, and he was locked in the cabin to await his return to Olympia and, of course, to a life of slavery, what they supposed would be a life of slavery but things didn't work out the way, uh, the way they were planned. Essentially, uh, Mitchell and, and, and the ship uh, landed in Victoria. Abolitionists in Victoria found out about Mitchell. They found out that he was being held, and they were able to free him and bring him before a, a magistrate, actually before the Chief Justice of the, uh, of the Provincial Supreme Court, and he was declared a free man. Let me repeat that. Charles Mitchell was declared, the boy, was declared a, a free man. Let me talk for one minute, and let me just indulge you for one minute about these groups, uh, about, about these people. These were black Californians who left the state of California in 1858 because they could no longer abide by racist laws, by the restrictions in California. And they made their way to British Columbia and because of the gold rush, and some of you may be familiar with the Fraser River or British Columbia gold rush in 1858. Because of the gold rush, virtually all of the police force and virtually all of the militia went off into the gold country and left the, left the, the capital of the territory undefended. And so the governor recruited these black folks, these black men, into, into the militia. They became the defenders of British Columbia. They also became the policemen the policemen for British Columbia. And they also committed themselves to abolition in every chance they got. And as a result, Charles Mitchell became free as a result. Um, let me go to the next image. This is the response from the Puget Sound Herald, which was a newspaper in Washington Territory. 
But this is a better response. Let me, let me show you what I call opposing viewpoints. Notice what's going on here. This is a debate over slavery. And this is a debate over slavery where at least one group of people want to go to war against Great Britain over this boy. Think about, think about this for a minute. There's a one group of people who want to go to war against Great Britain over, over this boy. On the other hand, look at the, uh, look at the uh, uh, Victoria colonists, their, their position on this. Mitchell should be free. And he was freed, and he remained free for the rest of his life. He remained in, in British Columbia. My point here in bringing all of this up is that there is, as I said before, there is a debate. There is a debate over slavery, and sometimes that debate almost comes to blows, even beyond uh, the territory of Kansas. These examples from my region, from the Pacific Northwest, argue that there was no corner in the West that was free from the debate about slavery, and the desire of some to impose slavery on all of the territories in the West, or the desire by others to keep the area free. In other words, that struggle is going on throughout the region. Would-be uh, Western slaveholders face a much more determined opposition to slavery in California than elsewhere. A dedicated, and yes, I did say, slavery in California. <laughs> a dedicated minority of black and white abolitionists, particularly in California, would undermine the peculiar institution in that, in that region, that territory. Now, theoretically, California is a free state. That's what you learn in all your history textbooks, okay? California is admitted to the Union in 1850 as a free state. The reality is that one third of the black population of about 3,000 people in California is enslaved. Let me repeat this, one third of the black population in free California is actually enslaved. And so there's this contradiction going. So there's, there's slavery even, even within the free state. But there's also something else going on. There are a host of dedicated abolitionists, and I'm gonna show you uh, some of them in a minute. The uh, dedicated abolitionists who are going to make those slaves free or do everything they can to make those slaves free. I want you to think about this for a minute. When we talk about the Civil War, we talk about the North and freedom and the abolitionists in the North and we talk about the slaveholders in the South. But there are two places that I can think of uh, where abolitionists and slaveholders came together. They came in close proximity, and they would do battle to see whether slavery would survive. One of those places is clearly Kansas, and I'm going to talk about that. And believe me, I'm going to get to Kansas in a minute. Uh, but the other place is California. I want you to imagine slaves walking the streets of San Francisco, and I want you to imagine those slaves encountering abolitionists, including black abolitionists like these individuals. Mifflin Gibbs, Mary Ellen Pleasant, Peter Lester. These abolitionists were dedicated to the idea of not freeing slaves in the abstract, or not freeing slaves in, uh, somewhere else, in Alabama or Mississippi. They had to deal with freeing slaves in San Francisco or in Sacramento, or in Berkeley, and various other places. And actually, they did a pretty good job. Let me give you an example of one. Peter Lester. Peter Lester was a Philadelphian by birth, came to California in 1850. He actually became a very prosperous merchant. He opened the Shoe and Boot Emporium and became one of the most prosperous merchants. Notice I didn't say one of the most prosperous black merchants. One of the most prosperous merchants in San Francisco but he was also dedicated to destroying the institution of slavery. And so he would bring slaves, California slaves, into, into his house, and he would lecture them on freedom. And as, he, as, as you can see here, he said, when they left my home, uh, we had them strong in the, fear, in the spirit of freedom. They were leaving slavery every day. In other words, the first step toward leaving slavery is understanding that you have freedom. The next step is actually taking the steps to ensure uh, that, that you have that, that freedom. So Peter Lester is an example of those in California who were fighting against the institution of slavery. But the grand example is right here. The grand example is right here. There were, there were literally hundreds, maybe even thousands of people who were going to be caught up. And when I talk about thousands, I mean people on both sides of the Kansas-Missouri border who were going to be caught up in a powerful political struggle 
that will determine the fate of Kansas, that will determine whether Kansas was going to be, be free. And certainly the, there were those who were dedicated, those abolitionists who were dedicated uh, to freedom in Kansas. I, I don't know how many of you are familiar with the Wayne Dot Indians. Uh, these guys were dedicated, they were, they were moved from, I guess, northern Ohio, northwestern Ohio out to this area and they dedicated themselves, for reasons I won't get into right now, but they dedicated themselves to liberty, they dedicated themselves to the abolition of slavery, which is in contrast to what happened with Indians in Indian territory, clearly. But they said there will be no slavery here, and I don't know how many of you are familiar with the town of Quindaro. How many of you have heard of Quindaro? Oh, some of you, okay. That town is named after uh, the Wayne Dot woman who, is, who essentially said we will not allow slavery. We will not allow slavery in, in this area. So, so, so there are a number of people who are beginning to speak out. Let me give you some um, more likely examples or examples that you're much more familiar with. Uh, let me explain this. <laughs> this. These are two photographs that I took two years ago when I came to Topeka to give a talk. Can you see, you know where they are. They're in the state capitol. How many of you have ever looked up and the uh, kind of the ceiling of the state capitol to see the na names that are inscribed all along there. So a couple of you, three or four, more than a few of you. Those names are the people who are the founders of Kansas. And notice the names that I'm showing here. Um, Charles Robinson, who is from here, I think, isn't he? Charles Robinson, John Brown, jo Joseph H., uh, uh, James H. Lane, and Montgomery. These are all abolitionists. These are all abolitionists. Folks, you can go to the Boston State Capitol and you're not gonna see abolitionists listed in the, in the state capitol building like this. You can go to, to a whole host of other places in the East. These are people who not only helped to found Kansas, they're also the people who helped to found the idea of freedom, the idea of freedom for everyone, including African Americans. John Brown, James H. Lane, James Montgomery led bands of Jayhawkers yeah, not the football or basketball team, but Jayhawkers into Missouri in the 18, late 1850s on raids uh, for slaves. And they, they literally brought those black folks out of, out of Missouri back into Kansas and in, into freedom. I thought I was going to show you a new image, but you guys see this everywhere, as, as I've realized. This, but I want to make this point as you look at this image. These are anti-slavery men in Kansas in 1859. Kansas was the only territory in the nation at that particular moment where white men risked their lives to go into a slave territory and free black men and women. Let me repeat that. Kansas was the only area, the only territory in the nation where white men risked their lives to go into a slave territory to free black slave women and men. There were abolitionists, as I said before, there were abolitionists in Massachusetts and they focused their attention, they focused their ire on, um, on people in the South, but they didn't go South. Well, William Lloyd Garrison did not go South before the Civil War. These are people who were literally risking their lives uh, to, try to, bring about, uh, to try to bring about freedom. Of course, the biggest challenge, or I shouldn't say the biggest challenge, the people who were gonna do the most to bring about freedom were black folks themselves. They were gonna vote with their feet and they were gonna vote by not the hundreds, but by the thousands to come to Kansas. And I wanna, I'll talk about them in a, in a minute. Those, those were the people who created black Kansas and they created it essentially because they understood that Kansas would be a free territory. Regardless of what other people thought, they understood that Kansas would be a free territory. In 1860, in 1860, there were only 627 African Americans in all of Kansas territory, which would soon be uh, the state of Kansas. By 1865, there were 12,000 black people in Kansas. Let me repeat those figures. In, 18, in 1860, there were 627 black folks in Kansas. By 1865, there were 12,000. I don't know of another state in the country where the black population rose so quickly, so dramatically. And these people who are coming to Kansas, are, as you can see here, they're coming for freedom. The explosion of Kansas's population, black population, can be explained uh, by a combination of politics and geography. This is the problem. 
these counties all along the border, the, along the Missouri side of the border, these are the most heavily slave counties in Missouri, some of the most heavily slave counties in Missouri. Kansas represents freedom. Kansas, if you could get to the West, if you could somehow know the manage to get to the West, you could get to, uh, you could get to your freedom. And so Kansas becomes an obvious destination, but the most obvious of these destinations in Kansas is a place, well, let me, let me show this. This is the Underground Railroad, and here's Lawrence. Lawrence is on, the, on one route of the Underground Railroad up into Iowa and then on to Canada. So Lawrence is part of a process or a network that's going to be, become critically important. But Lawrence is not just part of it. Lawrence eventually comes to symbolize the notion or the idea of freedom. This is an artist's rendering of Lawrence before the university is, is around. I guess the university is up here. This is, okay, this is the university, um, or this is the area before the university. Lawrence becomes the most well-known anti-slavery town in Kansas, and maybe the most well-known anti-slavery town in the entire country in the late 1850s. Um, you guys know the story. I won't repeat it here. Uh, the town essentially was founded by abolitionists, uh, named after uh, Amos Lawrence, who was himself a prominent abolitionist in, in Boston. Somebody, some, some founders of the town, decided to name the main street Massachusetts Street. That was like a red flag to those who were pro-slavery in Missouri. In other words, there, there are abolitionists who are establishing a town, and they are, they are literally, I don't know if I can say this in the Bill Tuttle lecture, but they are giving the finger to all of the pro-slavery <laughs> pro people who are just 30 miles away. Anti-slavery mass media, you've probably seen these. This, this, this is the response of Lawrence to Captain John, Brown, uh, John Brown's execution. This, is an, this gives you an idea of the sentiment of Lawrence people at that particular time. Let me give you another example. Citizens of Lawrence to arms, and they are essentially asking people to challenge deputy U.S. marshals who are about the business of trying to catch slaves. In other words, they are challenging the federal government itself in order to ensure the, that there is there's black freedom. Uh, this, is, this is remarkable. These, these are people who are risking their all. These are whites who are risking their all to defend black folks. And of course, there's a consequence for that. The consequence is that Lawrence was burned twice, as all of you know. Um, the second time, and, and Bill educated me on this. I didn't realize it. The, the second time was, of course, with Quantrell's raiders. And Quantrell killed, what, 180 people in Lawrence in that raid? And I, I'd like to believe that those 180 people were indeed, they, their lives were given because they wanted to defend black freedom. Let me repeat that. Their lives were taken from them by Quantrell's raiders because they wanted to defend black freedom. Now, there are, there are a whole host of other things going on with Quantrell, but Quantrell said, and this is almost a direct quote, I am going to teach those, and I won't say the word, but those uh, people, those in stealers a lesson. Uh, and he did by riding into this, this town and, and killing all of these people. But I want to, I want to go back to the idea of, of black folks seeking freedom themselves. Henry Clay Bruce. Black folks, as I said, would make their way to, to Kansas territory. Uh, they would make that short dash to the West for freedom. This is Henry Clay Bruce, and I want you to read his statement. Henry Clay Bruce, by the way, is the brother of Blanche K. Bruce, who would eventually become the second U.S. senator in the history of the nation. He was a uh, senator from Mississippi. Blan uh, Henry Clay Bruce said famously, well, I strapped around my waist a pair of Colts revolvers and plenty of ammunition. Uh, for the run to the border, and then he talked about avoiding the main roads and all. Now, this is a black man talking about escaping the freedom. Let me give you the other side of it. This is the Kansas, uh, this is the Lawrence, excuse me, the Leavenworth Daily Conservative. And I love this quote, and I'll just let you read it because it's a very powerful quote, but it's essentially people finding their way across a bridge of ice, a bridge of ice to freedom in Kansas. Notice the second paragraph. These people came among us wholly destitute of the means of living. Their sufferings were partially relieved by the benevolence and charity of friends here and elsewhere. Those friends were members of the Kansas Emancipation League. 
The Kansas Emancipation League was a group dedicated to black freedom. A group dedicated to black freedom. Uh, they were like abolitionist groups elsewhere, uh, but they were abolitionist groups, uh, they were an abolitionist group that was literally on the front lines. Uh, one of the members was none other than Richard Cordley, who was a prominent minister right here in, uh, uh, in Lawrence. And let me, let me show you his words. So there's a transformation going on in Kansas, and that transformation includes not just the arrival of blacks, but the attempt to try to integrate blacks into the body politic, the attempt to try to make sure that Lawrence is not just a place where blacks come to gain freedom, but a place where blacks will become part of the community. Now, we're talking about organizations like the uh, Kansas Emancipation League, but let me suggest another organization that doesn't get as much play or doesn't get as much attention, and that's the Ladies Refugee Aid Society. These are black women, black women from the local churches, many of whom had been enslaved themselves just a few years earlier, who put together resources, who raise money, who donate funds, who do everything they can to provide food, clothing, shelter, money to assist these destitute ex-slaves. In other words, these are people who have very little, but they're gonna share that very little with the others who, who are coming in. Now the Kansas Emancipation, oh, I'm, I'm sorry, I should say, the, the Ladies Refugee Aid Society will eventually evolve into the Kansas Federation of, General, of, of Colored Women's Clubs. Uh, the Kansas Emancipation League envisioned an exchange of black labor for black freedom. The fugitives were supposed to be dispersed to the, to the farms across the state to help with the harvest of the wheat crop. But ultimately, most black men in Kansas would pick up the rifle rather than the plow. Early on, there will be efforts to recruit black men into the, into the Army of the United States. Those efforts came as early as 1861, and of course one of the prominent leaders in this was Senator James H. Lane, who of course was another Lawrence resident. Um, and black men responded. You, I'll give you two statistics. Uh, some of you may know this. Uh, Kansas sent a larger proportion of men to the Union Army than any other northern state. Let me repeat that. Kansas sent a larger proportion of men to the Union Army than any other northern state. But I will also add that Kansas blacks sent a largest proportion of men to the Union Army of any blacks of any state in the North as well. In other words, a lot of these men were just a couple of years and sometimes just a couple of months from slavery. But they decided that the only way to ensure that slavery was destroyed would be to fight uh, with, with the Union Army. And of course, they would, they would fight admirably. I'm not, I'm not here to talk about uh, their role in the Civil War, but they were, they were involved in a number of uh, battles. And this is the battle flag of the first Kansas Colored Infantry Volunteers. Notice these women proudly holding it up. This is the battle flag of freedom. Let me say it again. This is the battle flag of freedom. This is, this is a battle flag that represents the, the effort to destroy, once and for all, the institution of slavery, not just in Kansas, because it's already gone from Kansas, but to destroy in Missouri and to destroy it everywhere in, in the United States. It didn't take long, however, for these new black Kansas citizens, those who were, who were fighting uh, against the Confederate forces in Missouri and elsewhere, to eventually decide that they had to they had to fight for their freedom here. They had to make sure that their rights were going to be protected, even as they were battling for liberty on the battlefield. In October of 1863, the first colored convention in the state of Kansas met. Uh, these conventions continue. They're now the NAACP conventions in Kansas. But essentially, black people got together uh, at, at Leavenworth in, uh, in October 1863 to talk about their issues, to talk about what they wanted. And you can see what they wanted. They wanted universal male suffrage. They wanted access to public education. They wanted the right to serve on juries. In other words, they wanted to be full-fledged citizens of the United States. Now, I want you to think about this date, 1863. In 1863, the war is still going on. In 1863, it's not exactly a sure thing that the Union's going to win. Nonetheless, these are people, the ex-slaves, many of them, most of them, these are people who say, we want to make sure that our rights are respected in Kansas. I, I, wanna, I wanna pull up this, these two statements because these statements come from the convention in 1863. 
Um, the first one is about self-help. It does not follow that because so much is being done for us, in other words, by the Kansas abolitionists, that we can do nothing for ourselves. But the second statement is even more powerful. Our misery is not necessary to your happiness. Your rights can never be secure while ours are denied. These are, these are telltale words, and they are words that resonate, or at least they should resonate uh, with you even, even to this day. As I indicated before this talk, Civil War events in Kansas uh, would continue to resonate powerfully throughout Kansas and eventually beyond Kansas and long after 1865. This is the battle that began in the 1850s. It did not end in the 1850s, unfortunately. There was still much work to do. Indeed, those blacks who, black Kansans who met in October 1863 initiated what I call the long civil rights struggle in this state. A civil rights struggle that in many regards is still going on right to this very day. So I want you to understand the relationship between history, uh, in this instance, the history of the founding of Kansas and the history of that struggle for freedom. And I'm gonna argue that that struggle for freedom in Kansas and a struggle for freedom that was often led by blacks in Kansas and supported by whites, sympathetic whites in Kansas, that struggle was as heroic let me emphasize these words, as, as heroic as the struggle in the South. We hear a lot more about the struggle in the South, but there was a powerful struggle that was going on here, here as well. In fact, in some ways, the 20th century Southern black civil rights struggle is initiated by events that take place in Kansas. You all are familiar with Brown v. Board of Education. You're all familiar with it. You're all familiar with uh, Linda Brown uh, from Topeka whose lawsuit, actually lawsuit was initiated by her, her parents, that lawsuit would change America. That lawsuit would change America, and the reverberations continue right to this very day. But let me suggest what you probably don't know. We, we sort of assume that la that lawsuit came out of the turmoil and the struggle of, let's say, the 1940s and the 1950s. And point of fact, in point of fact, the very first lawsuit filed to desegregate the schools in Topeka, Kansas, was filed by black women in 1879. <laughs> Let me repeat that. The very first lawsuit filed to desegregate the schools in, to in Topeka, Kansas, was filed in 1879. And so, so what, what the Brown family was doing was essentially taking up a struggle that had long been going on. And I, wanna, I, I want you to see an editorial uh, from the Topeka Colored Citizen that reflects on that long struggle. This is William Eagleson. William Eagleson was one of the many black newspaper editors in Kansas, but he was one of the most articulate, he was one of the most uncompromising of those newspaper editors. I'll let you read what he said in 1878, because this is the editorial that would inspire these black women to file suit to integrate the schools in Topeka, Kansas. As you can notice from the, from the last sentence, black Kansans did resolve to stop this situation. They resolved to stop the, the segregation. Uh, the point that I suggest here is that Kansas, as I said before, had its own civil rights struggle, and that civil rights struggle began in, in the Civil War. It continued into Reconstruction. When most people think about Reconstruction, they think about down south. They think about the battle for the right to vote in Mississippi and Arkansas and Alabama and other places. And I'm not taking anything away from that. That was, that was a heroic struggle. But there was a reconstruction campaign right here in Kansas. Let me repeat that. There was a reconstruction campaign right here in Kansas. There were black Kansans who obviously, understandably, uh, wanted to make sure that freedom would be extended to, to the people of Mississippi and Alabama and Georgia. And indeed, why not? Many of them were their relatives. But they also understood that they had grievances of their own. They also understood that they didn't have full civil rights in Kansas in 1865 or even 1875. Uh, the denial of the right to vote, the, the denial of the right to serve in the militia, and on and on and on. And so as a consequence, they were going to launch their own struggle. And one of the people who would be responsible for that struggle was Charles Henry Langston, another well, another Kansas resident. I don't know if he lived in Lawrence, uh, but certainly he came to Lawrence a number of times. Charles, Charles Henry Langston is 
probably a, a, a man who is not well known, not well known enough in terms of the struggle for freedom. And I hope that some people, uh, maybe even some people in this room, will decide to, uh, to write a dissertation on him so that we can have more on, on his life. Uh, Charles Henry Langston was an overlooked brother of uh, Congressman John Mercer Langston, and he was also an overlooked grandfather of Langston Hughes. Charles Henry Langston was a person who very much, there were a number of people who influenced Langston Hughes, but Charles, Charles Henry Langston was certainly one of those. He was dedicated to the idea of civil rights in Kansas. Kansas. He was born in Virginia. He was educated at Oberlin College uh, in Ohio. He arrived in Leavenworth in 1862 to, to help blacks gain, gain their rights and to educate them. And he became very quickly a leader of the civil rights effort in Kansas at that particular time. This is a statement that he made in 1866. And of course, the key to understanding rights, and particularly civil rights, is getting the right to vote. And black, black folks had to struggle to get the right to vote uh, in Kansas. And in 1866, there was a remarkable convention that took place right here in Lawrence. It was the, it was the proceedings of the Convention of Colored Citizens. It was a kind of a continuation of what had happened in 1863 in Leavenworth. And you can see the executive committee. These, these are all black men. Unfortunately, they didn't include women at this point in their deliberations, but all, all these black men gathered right here in Lawrence, Kansas, and, and they talked about the problems, and they also talked about what, what would be done about them. This is their statement. They demand voting rights in 18, at this 1866 convention. I love the last paragraph. It says, we must be we must be a constant trouble in this state until it extends to us equal and exact justice. We must be a constant trouble in this state until it extends to, it extends to us equal and exact justice. You know, folks, I've, I've read this quote a couple of times, maybe more than a couple of times. When I first saw it, I thought I was reading Malcolm X. But the, these are black men who were speaking out about civil rights and, uh, and their demand for that civil rights um, in, in Kansas, and particularly in Lawrence, Kansas, in 1866. Now, unfortunately, they didn't get what they wanted. In 1867, and some of you may know this history, in 1867, there was a referendum in Kansas. Kansas still boasted of itself as the most radical state in the country, but the most radical state in the country in 1867 voted down suffrage for black men, okay, it also voted down by an even wider margin, suffrage for women. It also voted down by an even wider margin, suffrage for women. In other words, the most radical state in, in the Union was still not willing to embrace those very, very powerful reforms at that particular time. For black men, at least, this was resolved with the 15th Amendment, which allowed male suffrage. But Charles Langston, uh, uh, Charles Langston would continue his agitation literally up until his death in, in 1892. Now, so far I've talked about freedom as the quest for the ballot, the quest for civil rights. Let me suggest that there's another type of freedom that comes uh, with, with Kansas, and that is the freedom to own land. And indeed, I would argue that the, the freedom to own land is as fundamental, or at least in the minds of, of the black folks at the time, it was as fundamental as the freedom to vote. And as a result, large numbers of, of blacks would come to Kansas in the 1870s, 1880s, even into the 1890s with the desire to own land. Let me give you one example of this. Let me, uh, and I go back to an editorial comment from the Topeka Colored Citizen in 1879. Our advice to the colored people is to come west to Kansas. Our advice to the colored people is to come west to Kansas. And of course, there had already been the discussions about how you know, Kansas was a difficult place and blacks wouldn't be accepted. At the same time, the Topeka, uh, the Topeka Colored Citizen says, it's better to starve the deaf in Kansas than to be shot and killed in the South. In other words, freedom means moving. Freedom means movement. It means leaving where you are and going, going somewhere else. And Kansas would become 
a major destination for black people. I'll, I'll, go, I'll be so bold as to say Kansas would become the major destination for black people out of the South, at least up until 1900 at least up until black people began to turn their attention to the northern cities um, uh, at that particular point. Why Kansas? Let me explain. Oh, this is a map of Kansas and I want to put it up, but I, I want to move, I, I want to show you another slide in a minute. But the reasons as to why Kansas would become the destination for all these black folks who wanted freedom, the reasons are both practical and psychological. Practical in the sense that Kansas was the closest place where homesteaded land or homesteading was, was still possible. In other words, it was the closest place to the South where black folks could get relatively free land. And homesteading was a major factor. Black folks wanted, black folks were poor, and they wanted to homestead because they felt that that was the best way to, to gain access to land. And why not? Homesteading was a process by which thousands, tens of thousands of whites were gaining land in Kansas and all, all over the West. The 1862 Homestead Law, uh, which applied to Kansas and other western states and territories, was uncomplicated and unambiguous. The federal government provided 160 acres of land to any settler who paid the $12 filing fee and resided on the land and improved it for five years. But if the, after six months, you purchased the land outright for $1.25 per acre, it was yours. And so millions of land, millions and millions of acres of lands were opened up. Pub, this is public domain lands, and I'm, I'm treading on your territory here, but you, you, everybody knows the story of how this land was going to be opened up uh, in, in Kansas, and black folks took part in this home setting process. And that's not a surprise. That's not a surprise. But black folks also looked to Kansas for other reasons. One of those reasons was the Kansas Republican Party. Now, I always, I, I've been thinking, how am I going to address this? Because the Kansas Republican Party of today is a bit different from the Kansas Republican Party of the 1870s. The Kansas Republican Party of the 1870s, how do I say this, was dedicated to black freedom. Well, at least on paper, they were dedicated to black freedom. There were some who were not all that enthused about the idea of large numbers of blacks coming. But there were still far more who said, we should welcome these African Americans, particularly the ones who were suffering uh, uh, in the South. Frederick Douglass said it best, and I'll, I'll read his statement here, the Republican Party is the ship, and all else is the sea. And as a result, a lot of black folks in the South decided we should go where the ship is strongest, and Kansas had the strongest Republican Party in the country at that time. Maybe it still does, but certainly, <laughs> certainly at that time, it had the strongest Republican Party. I, there, there's another reason. Blacks and whites fell sway to shrewd immigration agents and land speculators who described Kansas as the Garden of the West. In other words, it was the place where corn grew you know, 10 feet tall. I, I, <laughs> it was, and I want to quote here. The country is well watered. This is one speculator, a man named George Marlowe, a black uh, speculator who wanted to lure African Americans out uh, from Louisiana. He said, the country is well watered and corn grows anywhere from nine to 12 feet high. <laughs> he then described the mild summers in Kansas. <laughs> All of this was designed, obviously, to get people to come to Kansas at the time. And I, I wanted to use this illustration. Let me explain it. Some of you may know Henry Worrell. I don't know if you, you're familiar with him, Bill, but he was a local artist in 1870 who did this drawing, which was kind of satire, kind of a parody of the way in which Kansas is described by these speculators. And you can see the guy with the corn off to the left, and you can see the grapes growing. I don't know if they grow grapes here, but you can see the grapes growing everywhere. And, and, and I don't know what, I guess this is a potato that's being dug up out of the ground. If, if you see this, then you, you understand what these, what these speculators and what these land promoters were doing. They were promoting a myth. But it was a myth that a lot of people, black and white, bought into as they made their way to Kansas. But I, I want to suggest that there's one thing that's even more serious in terms of why black folks came to Kansas. Kansas still had that abolitionist legacy. Whether it was true or not, whether it was true or not, black people still believed the idea that Kansas was a place of freedom. They still identified Kansas with John Brown, and why not? This was where John Brown first took action to try to destroy the institution of slavery. 
Kansas was the first state to ratify the emancipation, or excuse me, to, to support, publicly support the Emancipation Proclamation. It was the first state to ratify the 13th Amendment. It was one of the first states to ratify the 14th Amendment. Kansas became, for a lot of African Americans, the symbol of freedom. We think of the United States as a place where immigrants come. We think of immigrants from all over the world making their way to the United States as a place of freedom. For a lot of folks, Kansas was that place of freedom in the 1870s. Not just black folks, not just black folks, but for immigrants from all around the world, Kansas was that place of freedom. And so it's not a surprise that black folks would feel the same way. Here are the exodusters bound for Kansas. I'm not going to talk about them, but I want to use the exodusters as a backdrop to a story about one of them, and his name was John Solomon Lewis. And I'll do this story very quickly because I know we've been up here for a while. John Solomon Lewis was uh, a Louisiana sharecropper. In 1879, he and his family decided that they were going to leave Louisiana. They had had enough of what they call bulldozing. They had had enough of the violence uh, and the cheating that took place uh, almost routinely with sharecroppers. And so Lewis went to, his, uh, the, to the landowner and he said, uh, and, I thought he, and I imagine he thought he was being polite, he said to the landowner, I think I'm going to move to Kansas. And the landowner got angry with him and he said, if you attempt to move, we will kill you. If you attempt to move, we will kill you. So John Lewis, and his family sneaked out of their, their sharecropper cabin, went into the woods, literally into the swamp, and remained there for three weeks waiting for a riverboat that was bound north uh, up the Mississippi. He finally was able to spot a riverboat, and the riverboat captain was sympathetic, and the captain said, you know, where, where do you want to go? Where, where do you want to go? And Lewis memorably said one word, Kansas. One word, Kansas. I mean, Kansas had that idea. Kansas had that image among African Americans at that time. And of course, there are large numbers of blacks who are going to make their way out here. I mean, we, we, talk, we can talk about a lot of them. George Washington Carver, for example. How many of you knew that George Washington Carver lived in Kansas? Oh, OK, a few people. Uh, there, there were others who would come as individual settlers. But the most famous group that would come would be the founders of Nicodemus. And I won't go in detail on that story because you probably already know it, but these are the black men from Lexington, Kentucky, who founded Nicodemus, which was going to be the most famous of the all-black towns uh, in the West. And it became famous because, quite frankly, the New York Times discovered it in 1879 and, and told the story all around the world. Uh, these folks saw freedom as in Western Kansas. They saw freedom as the ability to own land. They made their way to Western Kansas, but in many instances, they were not prepared. They were not exactly prepared for what they were going to, to see. Imagine, if you can, Kentucky people. Kentucky people, particularly people in Lexington, Kentucky, and around Lexington, Kentucky, who decide they're going to make their way to Western Kansas. You can't imagine, well, maybe you can imagine how stark the contrast was between central Kentucky in Western Kansas. I'm showing an image here, and I show this image only because it's reflective of what was being written at the time. Western Kansas was described as, quote, flat, barren, desert-like. It was hardly the Garden of the West that the promoters had said. Uh, one newspaper editor in Nicodemus described the country as follows. The land is so flat, the land is so flat that you can see what your neighbor is doing in the next county. Um, <laughs> this, is, this is the environment. This is the environment that black folks made their way to uh, in the 18, 1870s. And I want to talk about one of those folks, a Kentuckian, a former Kentuckian named Willie Anna Hickman. Willie Anna Hickman, I'll let you read the quote. She, uh, she came out with her husband. Her husband had already been out. Uh, he brought his family out later. Uh, and she said that she got to Nicodemus. I looked with all the eyes I had. Where is Nicodemus? I don't see it. And you, can, and you can read the next paragraph. I mean, these, these must have been challenge, these must have been unimaginable challenges for people who were coming to that area of Kansas at first. And not just black folks, everybody was, was uh, facing this challenge. But these were black folks who nonetheless took the challenge, and Williana Hickman and her, uh, and her descendants continued to live in Nicodemus and live in Nicodemus uh, to this day. Let me, 
Let me give you another example. This is Nicodemus is described by the Cyclone, a local newspaper. Now, let me get a bit personal. This is uh, the Nicodemus historical marker that I, this is the picture that I took a couple of years ago when we went to Nicodemus. How many of you have been to Nicodemus? Wow, okay, I'm, I'm very impressed. I had been to Nicodemus, I had never been to Nicodemus before 2010, and I came at the time of the Nicodemus parade. Yes, there, there are probably 300 black folks who live year round in Nicodemus, but I think something like 10,000 descend on the town uh, every August for the Nicodemus celebration, and this was, this was part of the parade that was going on. This is the legacy. This is literally the legacy of those folks who, who came to Kansas at that, at that particular time. Um, success for black farmers in Nicodemus and other Kansas settlements rested on a tenuous foundation of ample credit and rain. And if you had less than you needed, you were in trouble. And I need to, you know, all we need to do is talk about what's going on now, and you can understand the disaster that could happen. Yet hundreds of black farmers, maybe even thousands of black farmers, did find freedom and success on the Kansas prairies. I want you to look at this, uh, well, I, this is a group of statistics, but I want you to look at these because they were a surprise to me. For these farmers, land ownership had enormous psychological as well as economic rewards. Cultivating one's own farm, raising one's crops to sustain one's family was the key to respectability in what was essentially an agricultural state. Black Kansans believed, sincerely believed, that in farming, that enga in engaging in farming, they were promoting ambition and virtue. As one Nicodemus newspaper declared in 1879, and I don't have this um, as, a, as an image, Negroes should be put on the land, given a start, and then let alone to work or starve. If left in the towns, they will become thoroughly demoralized and in time, utterly useless. Uh, I don't necessarily subscribe to that sentiment, but un you can understand that attitude at that particular time. And, and certainly, there were a lot of black folks who did prosper. Let me come up with, we'll, we'll take a look at this, uh, this uh, quote here. Now this is prosperity in the abstract. Let me suggest prosperity as an example. <coughs> Junus Groves. I'm not gonna ask how many people have heard of him. He's a remarkable individual. Oh, Bill has heard of him. He was the potato king. And what I mean by that is that by 1907, he was the largest grower of Irish potatoes anywhere in the country. He started out essentially as a slave. He saved his money, he saved his resources, he made his, his way out. He was a kid, as a kid he was a slave. Uh, he made his way out to Kansas in 1879 as part of the Exodus. He arrived with $1.25 in his pocket. And of course, look at his quote, by keeping my eyes open, always attending to duty, uh, my wages arose, essentially my wages uh, raised to, as he said, to 75 cents a day. 75 cents a day, and yet he saw this as being on the road to prosperity. Eventually, that is 20 years after, Groves would have this house. This would be the largest house in that area of Kansas. It would be the first house uh, with electricity, with, uh, that is with electric lights, with telephones, with hot and cold running water. This, was a, this would be a 22 room home, brick home in Edwardsville, Kansas. Junus Grove said, and I'm quoting here, a bushel of corn raised by a Negro is worth just as much as a bushel of the same grade raised by a white man. For Groves and other prosperous farmers in Kansas, this was the way to freedom. In other words, owning land, becoming successful farmers, was a way of establishing one's independence and a way of saying, I am a citizen. I am literally a citizen of the, of, of the United States. Now, the African-American freedom struggle in Kansas didn't end with Groves, even though my, uh, my dates are, uh, end in 1877. That freedom struggle would continue well beyond that. Let me give you an example, and, I'll, I'll, and then I'll conclude. Then I'll wrap this up. In 
you all know about Greensboro. And of course, I'm reminding you of the Greensboro sit-ins uh, with this slide, with this graphic. Uh, February 1st, 1960. What you probably don't know, or what many of you may not know, is that two years before Greensboro, there was a sit-in at the Dockham Drugstore in Wichita, Kansas. And that sit-in at the Dockham Drugstore in Wichita, Kansas, inspired the sit-in in Greensboro. And of course, as you know, the sit-in in Greensboro would change the, the entire South. And so, so what we see going on in Kansas has an impact far beyond the, uh, beyond the state. Let me, let me let you read the statement of Ron Walters. He was, he was the 18-year-old leader of that, uh, that sit-in in 1958, actually a 20-year-old leader in 1958. And you can see his words. And, and what I like about this quote is that he's talking about the fact that he doesn't know what's going to happen. If we look back on it now, we can say that these were brave people and they, they knew they were going to have success. They knew they were going to change history. No, they didn't. No, they didn't. They had no idea. And they were taking a risk, but they were willing to take that risk uh, for freedom. And so, so what, happens in, what happens in Wichita matters because that event in Wichita would eventually influence the rest of the country, and particularly those, those in the South. Let me end with this, uh, this image, and this is an image from none other than Lawrence, Kansas. These are actually two images from Lawrence, Kansas. The struggle continues. Even into the 1960s, there was discrimination. And in the 1960s, there were going to be those blacks and those white supporters who would challenge that discrimination. Now, understand that uh, discrimination hasn't been wiped out even to this day. It certainly wasn't wiped out by the civil rights movement in the South in, in the 1960s. I wish it were. Uh, but most of the racial grievances and most of the, 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 the worst of the racial grievances were put aside by the Civil Rights Act and various other measures. But as important as the legislation itself, the, the, the whole campaign in the South, and I would dare say the whole campaign here in, in Lawrence, was a wake-up call for all of the citizens. It was, a, it was a reminder that the freedom struggle that began in the 1850s continues. It continues into the 1960s, and perhaps it, it, it continues right to this day in Lawrence. Uh, Bill will be better able to speak to that than, than I would. But let me suggest to you as my, my final comment, let's make sure that that struggle that began in the 1850s in Lawrence and continued into the 1960s, let's make sure that we don't have another speaker coming here 100 years from now and talking about the continuation of that struggle. Let's make sure that we can end it now. Thank you very much. Dr. Taylor, um, it's, a, it's a real pleasure uh, for you to be here with us. Um, you've, you've done so much to uh, document and establish African American life in the West. Uh, your work has, has been uh, very important to my own. And I just want to, you know, thank you for, for your work and for well, coming and honoring us and honoring Bill Tuttle mm -hmm. um, by being here. Um, I've, I've noticed, uh, I was just thinking about all the famous Kansans, mm -hmm. Aaron Douglas, Gwendolyn Brooks, I don't know if Coleman Hawkins counts, but he definitely plied his trade in, in Kansas. And uh, there are so many people from other points in the West, like Wallace Thurman, that all became famous. Mm -hmm. um, and it seems to me like they, just like white Kansans, like Buster, uh, Buster Keaton, you know, really had to leave Kansas right. to become famous. And to this day, if you tell people about uh, the black history in the West, mm -hmm. it comes as something of a surprise, almost as if uh, black people in the North have been so closely associated with the Great Migration and mm -hmm. with the great mm -hmm. industrial cities and with the cultural products that came out of those cities. Um, and so I'm wondering if you've thought about like why, conceptually, why people uh, sometimes have, have problems or lack the ability to really think about the West as a black space. Yeah, that's, that's actually the subject for another lecture, but, <laughs> but I'll try to answer it quickly. And, and perhaps too quickly, I, I think part of the problem there, there, there's a public perception problem and then there's a historian's problem. The, let me start with the historian's problem and then I'll do the public perception thing. Uh, 
The historian's problem is that we as a, as a group of historians, uh, those of us who are interested in African American history uh, and those of us who are interested in Western history, have just excluded uh, African Americans in the West. I mean, that, that there's this idea that black history in the West is a footnote to the history of the South or the history of the North. And there's also an idea that black history in the West for Western historians is a footnote to a much more powerful story. Because you know, when you think about Western history and you think about groups of color, you think about Native Americans. You think about Latinos. Uh, you think about Asian Americans. And certainly, there's been a rich body of literature that's evolved over, over the years for those groups. Uh, there's just very little on African American history in the West. And I've, I'm going to share with you, since you guys are brave enough to have stayed and loyal enough to have stayed when everybody else left, I, I, I think there's, a, there's, there's kind of a, 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 an idea that somehow or another Blacks as people of color don't fit the larger Western narrative. I, I, you know, I, I don't have any proof of this, but it's my sense that when people imagine, and here I'm talking about historians, when historians imagine the West, they imagine other groups of color and they don't imagine African Americans until, until World War II. And that, that gets me to the second part of this, the public perception. That's the perception of almost everyone, that there weren't black communities. Now, Kansas is different because even in World War II, there wasn't a significant rise in the black population in Kansas. But um, correct me if I'm wrong on that, but certainly nothing like what would happen in California or Washington or Oregon or Nevada. Uh, but, but World War II was considered the watershed. And so when historians do talk about African Americans in the West, they tend to focus on the post-World War II period. And, you know, and perception is almost, yeah, you know, sometimes it's based on reality. There are far more blacks who were visible in places like San Francisco and Los Angeles and the like at, um, after that time. Um, I don't know about Kansas, um, and, and maybe Bill could speak to this question more so than I, I, I can. I, Kansas, there, there are a couple of, well, there's Kansas City, there's Topeka, there's Wichita, and Wichita has had a black community for a long time, but but I don't know if anyone who's uh, anyone who's written a great deal on it. I, that my here, okay. I'm. This is the problem. The problem is not that there that the history is not there, that the sources aren't there, is that historians aren't interested. Okay, and until historians become interested, there's th there's going to be this idea that the history doesn't exist. Um, I'll, I'll, you know, I know we we have limited time, but. Let me tell you about, let me tell you one story that uh, uh, involved my own research in the Pacific Northwest. And it's actually a story on another George, George Washington. Yeah, these guys all have presidents' names, George Bush, George Washington. There was this black guy named George Washington who founded this town called Centralia, Washington. He founded it in 1872. I visited Centralia in 1972 for the first time, 100 years later. I walk into the public library. No one has heard of George Washington, the founder of the town, okay? Uh, no one knows what, what his history is, his connection to the town. We then began to write about George, you know, George Washington. Others began to write about George Washington. I go back in 1992, and guess what? There's a mural uh, that's two stories high on one of the largest banks <laughs> in, in Centralia, and it's a mural of George Washington. I go back to the library, which is actually situated in the park, uh, the public library. The park, public library is in a park that's now named George Washington Park. In, in other words, once people began to write about George Washington, once he was, quote, discovered, then others wrote about him, and then the, the story became more known. Um, one of my frustrations is that even after doing the book on the West, there haven't been a lot of people, certainly there were more than before, but there haven't been a lot of people who've sort of taken up the cause, and you know, I'm getting old, I'm getting sort of long in the tooth, but <laughs> haven't been people to take up the cause to write about other aspects of African American history in various places. Uh, Bill has done as much as he can to try to change that, but you know, it's, it, it, it takes a lot of effort to try to get people focused on, on that, that topic. You know, Thank I, you. Okay, I, maybe that was too long an answer, I, but yeah, that's the the problem is perception. It's not numbers. That's the key. It's not numbers. It's perception. 
It's the perception that there's no history there. And as a result, people don't do the research on it. Rando, your class is gone, but you're, you're here. Hey, I'm, I'm, <laughs> teachers are always here, right? OK. Uh, <laughs> but uh, one, thank you for uh, presenting the problem of slavery as a national problem, because it's, it's often described in, in such a truncated way as though this is a Southern problem. Yeah. Yeah. And we often forget that 1827 emancipation of the mid-Atlantic states mm -hmm. um, uh, beforehand. So slavery is a national problem. So I really do appreciate you sort of giving this, this, uh, this greater, greater picture. Um, I, just a com another comment, I hope those of us who are coming up to Bill uh, we'll have a chance to have the graduate student, students bill has. So you can talk to our chancellor and make sure uh, we have support for those students so they can do. So they can do that work. Do, do yeah, that that's work. the other thing. Do, you know, do how do work. we yeah, make sure there's money available? Um, for what I'm struck by, because just driving around and my own colleague standing over there is from Independence, Kansas, and all of these small Kansas towns that have black populations. Uh, uh, Fort Scott, uh, mm -hmm. Independence, and town after town, um, Coffeeville, mm -hmm. uh, and and once again, I'm I'm struck by the the there are sources all around, mm -hmm. but nobody's writing about them. Um, the other thing is, I would like you to talk just a bit, because uh, since it's a presidential year, uh, there were also a, a handful of people, or two or three, maybe a family of Black Mormons going into Utah uh, uh, in, in with Brigham Young. And yeah, actually, you know, it's more than a handful. Yeah, well, a, that, right. Yeah, well, yeah. I mean, can you just elaborate on that? Oh, OK. The, the, the first thing, I, and you, thank you for giving me that opportunity to say something about the Mormons and in the context of the presidential election. <laughs> OK, with, with Mitt Romney. <laughs> OK. I, my own research, and I am not an expert on blacks in the Mormon church, but uh, you know, just a, a, a casual reading of Mormon history will suggest that before Brigham Young's pronouncement that blacks should not, black males should not hold the priesthood, uh, the Mormon faith welcomed a lot of African Americans. There were even some African Americans who were leaders of the church, and there were uh, there were black priests uh, in the church. You know, we have Elijah Abel on the on the website. There were black priests in the church at least up until uh, the early 1850s. And then, of course, there's the the revelation. I shouldn't call it a pronouncement. There's a revelation, and you know, I won't get into a lot of detail here now. But I think the revelation had a lot to do with the politics of the time, and that revelation eliminated blacks as as eligible for the priesthood. It didn't eliminate blacks from the church. There's a, there's a difference there. And there were black Mormons throughout this time period. Uh, I, I would say only in the 1880s, uh, maybe even into the 1890s, would there be more black non-Mormons in Utah than there were black Mormons. And of course, the, the Mormon church has be, began its outreach efforts. This is the 20th century Mormon church. After the revelation, uh, that said that black males could become priests. I think that was in 1978. The Mormon Church uh, began a huge outreach program, and now uh, it has significant representation in Africa and Latin America. Um, not suggesting that that's you know a quid pro quo, but it, but certainly it's interesting that all of a sudden there's this interest in in that part of the world, and the revelation goes well. The new revelation says the black man can be uh, can be priest. Um, the Mormon church is, is, is diverse. You know, I, there, there are those who make the charge that it's an all-white church, it's a racist church. I, I just don't accept that. You know, I, first of all, I don't accept it because there have been people, I'll say this, people who have been trying to get me in the Mormon church for years. <laughs> okay, <laughs> just personally on that. And the second thing is that I've, I've met and interviewed too many black Mormons uh, to, to, to sort of dismiss the idea that there, there, there aren't Mormons uh, who, are, who look like me. So, so there's, there, there is a Mormon presence. There, indeed, now there are, I guess, a, Mormon, a black Mormon caucus in the church. There are enough blacks in the church to have a caucus. And they are, you know, they're lobbying uh, the church hierarchy to, uh, to get more power, more influence in the church. So, so it's a struggle. I, I always say that the Mormon church, in terms of its pronouncements about blacks, uh, 
was really no different from every other mainline church in the 19th century. The problem is that as those mainline churches rejected that idea, the, the idea of black uh, separatism or black exclusion, the Mormons continue to this, at least up to a point. But yeah, there, there, are, there are black Mormons. I, there's one running for Congress <laughs> now from, uh, from Utah, so, excuse me? I, I didn't hear you. Ah, Haitian descent, yeah. And I'm not surprised, I'm not surprised, because as I said, the, uh, the Mormons have done very, very well uh, in Latin America, obviously in the Caribbean, certainly in Africa, certainly in Nigeria. In 1989, there were a lot of Mormon missionaries <laughs> in Nigeria, which was a surprise to me. Yes, ma'am. Hi, my name is Cassie Osei, and mm -hmm. I am an undergrad in the history department. Okay. Um, I wanted to go back to your um, revelation that although there are many histories available, it's not that um, they cannot be written, it's that historians are not interested. Um, I am reading a collection of essays. Mm -hmm. um, it's called Telling Histories, and it's about black women historians mm -hmm. coming up um, after the civil rights period. Mm -hmm. And I was wondering if you found any opposition to writing your book on um, black, black people in the West and um, yeah. slavery in the West. I, I, I didn't find opposition. I, no one stood in the way or said, I mean, there are people who said, you're not gonna find enough information. And there was a colleague of mine, and I'm not gonna call her name, she's now at the University of Arizona. When I told her that I was going to, to write on uh, the Black West, she said, oh, I love stories about black cowboys. And, and the idea was that this is, this is the entirety of black Western history. And I, you know, I have a 400 page book and I probably spend two and a half pages on cowboys. And it's not to say that cow black cowboys didn't exist, it's to say that black Western history is much larger and much richer than that. But, but yeah, I, I, I know the book. I haven't read it. It's one of those books that I want to buy. Uh, but uh, yeah, I, we'll, talk, we'll talk later. But, but yeah, I, I think there is, there has been in the past, uh, a perception that one can't research a particular area because it hasn't been researched before. Now, historians and obviously people in American studies are getting away from that, and they're looking at all kinds of areas. But, but, um, but no, no one ever said to me, you can't do this. As a matter of fact, um, I think it's just the opposite. Once I, once I started and once I started down that path, I think there, there was a lot of support for it. Do you think, um, sorry, mm -hmm. um, Randall Jelks is my professor for American um, identities, and okay. we explore, um, the intersections of gender, race, class, et cetera. Do you think that might be um, an example of the privilege you hold as a black male rather than a black female? Uh, what might be an example? What, what, what do you mean? That you didn't find any opposition to your um, topic. Hmm, I don't know. That, that's a good question. I can't answer that because I'm not a black female. Uh, what have you read in the book? Have, have there been women who, women historians have said they weren't allowed to research their topics? It wasn't that they weren't allowed. It was just nobody, they said that nobody was interested or mm -hmm. um, they didn't have the time to find right. Yeah, now, I, I began to do my research on, on the Black West after I was, uh, after I was out of school. Uh, so the, the question of what, what my advisor wanted to do was, was immaterial at that time. Um, yeah, I, I don't think this has any, I, I, I may be wrong on this, I don't think this has anything to do with gender per se. I mean, people told me that you're not gonna find enough information or there's not enough information out there. In other words, they, they suggested to me that I should look elsewhere and the reason they, I think the reason they did this is because they sincerely believed that there wouldn't, wouldn't be any information. And that's, that's why we as historians have to push against the grain. You know, I wouldn't accept that premise that since nothing has been written on this, we shouldn't write it. Actually, that's the reason to write. 
And so I can tell you right now, I, you know, if somebody tells you don't write on a particular topic, write on it. <laughs> okay? I mean, that's, that's what you have to do. I don't, don't let someone sort of suggest to you that you can't do this. I mean, or don't let someone suggest that they suggested to me. Well, there are no sources out there. You don't know if there are any sources out there until you do the research. And in terms of the Black West, the area that I know, there are, there are hundreds of thousands of sources. I mean, we've been talking, you've been talking for the last day and a half about all the sources on local black history here in, here in Lawrence that have, have uh, essentially unmined. So, so th there's far more history to be done than there is history that's already been done. And what we really need are people like you to go on and say, whatever, whatever discouragement you get, and I don't know what kind of discouragement you've already gotten, but to ignore it and say, this is now, I don't want you to, to tell Professor Yeltsin, uh, I'm not going to do what you say. <laughs> no, I don't want you to go that far, but, but I want you to get your degree, and I want you to go out and research what you want to research. No one's going to tell you what the, what the right or what not the right. Certainly, I, I wouldn't dare tell you what the right or what not the right. And uh, it's hard for me to imagine somebody else it's hard to imagine a historian doing that. I mean, I, I hope you agree. Let's <laughs> thank you. Wait a minute. No, this is one more question. No, 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 no. We have a Minnesota connection here, so he's got to <laughs> So Tidwell has to ask his question. Well, uh, first of all, thank you for coming. Uh, as Randall said, I'm from Southeast Kansas, Independence. And each time uh, there's a speaker that comes in and talks about um, Kansas and black history and our place in the world, uh, it really rejuvenates me and uh, it fills me with a sense of pride because mm -hmm. where I do go out and about and say that I'm from Kansas, I say that with, with pride. Okay. And not with the kind of embarrassment that a lot of people um, who have brought, well, I shouldn't go there. <laughs> Whatever. My question is this. Okay. <laughs> My question is this. Uh, I was thinking about the, uh, the image of the um, Kansas um, Republican Party mm -hmm. that uh, you showed, and uh, it's sort of interesting to me because it seems like it kind of fostered uh, this mythology of Kansas as a free state. And I do know that there's a lot of discussion taking place about the ways in which Kansas was actually not a free state. Mm -hmm. It was not welcoming. Uh, one of our graduate students about 10 years ago wrote a dissertation entitled Free mm -hmm. Did Not Mean Welcome. Right. And I was right. wondering if you could talk a little bit about um, uh, that Kansas Republican Party and the other side of all of this. In other the words, counter narrative. How, how they yeah. were not yeah. really uh, welcoming to yeah. Af African Americans. I, you know, I, I don't know as much about it as I probably should, and my focus today was really on, on the image of Kansas. But that image was slowly being chipped away. And, and if you remember, I mentioned the, the referendum in 1867. That's a powerful indication of the fact that that Kansas was not as liberal as, as it had been. I should have mentioned, I should have mentioned that there was slavery in Kansas, that there were slaves, that of those 627 people in Kansas in 1860, some of them were slaves. So, there were, so even though the people of Lawrence would fight against slavery, uh, not, everyone in, not everyone in Kansas was so disposed to do that. And these, these weren't necessarily Missourians bringing slaves over. These were uh, people from all over who, who dedicated to the idea of slavery. You know, the, you know except for a few twists and turns, and, and let me suggest this. If Lawrence didn't exist, might the history have been different? If Lawrence, I mean, I, I don't want to privilege Lawrence too much, but, but Lawrence is this huge beacon of anti-slavery and abolitionist uh, activity, and had it not existed, uh, you know, then the debate over slavery might have gone in a different direction. I, I think of California. You know, no one thinks of, Cal of slavery in California in the same sentence. And yet there were people, as late as 1857, there were people who wanted to impose slavery on California. Uh, in 1857, you saw the statement from, uh, from Oregon. There were people who said slavery was already here. We simply need to ratify. We simply need to acknowledge that fact. So, so there, there is this, this contestation going on. But, but in terms of Kansas history, to get back to your idea of Kansas history, I think that that referendum, for me at least, was very telltale. Because as I said before, the, the vote uh, was against black men. It was also against women including white women. And that suggested to me that the, the radical image of Kansas may have been overblown. 
In the 1870s, when the Exodusters came out, there was a, there was a fight in the Republican Party. There were some who welcomed those, those black exodus and some who looked for votes, who said there would be more votes. There were others who were, who were appalled at the idea that all of these black newcomers would come out and they, they assumed they would all eventually be on the dole. Not Bob Dole, they would be on, on the dole. And, and, uh, and that they would, they would be horrific. And so there was a debate going on uh, within, the, uh, you know, within the Republican Party at that time. I would dare argue that there were probably debates going on between the anti-slavery people and the abolitionists about the role of blacks in Kansas, because the anti-slavery people, as we all know, as we should know, anti-slavery people were not necessarily people who believed in black rights. Only the abolitionists subscribed to that, and even the abolitionists were shaking on that question uh, sometimes. And so, so yeah, there's, there's this attitude, but, but eventually, Eventually, Kansas grows more and more conservative. Um, it grows more and more mature, uh, if you will. Uh, there are various conservative movements that come up. There's a liberal strand or a liberal tradition, but eventually those, as I understand politics, those conservative strands will, will come to dominate the Republican Party by, certainly by the, by the 1960s and 1970s. Uh, yeah, this, the, the Republican Party of Kansas today would probably be just the opposite of the Republican Party that we thought of, or that, that was imagined, and notice my words here, that was imagined by black folks. I mean, these people in Mississippi and Alabama hadn't seen a white Kansas Republican. <laughs> you know, they were just going on the, the, the brown image. They were going on what Kansas had done before. They were going on what they were told about Kansas as a place of freedom. Now, having said that, Having said that, I will say in comparison that as difficult as the situation was for blacks in Kansas, it was far more difficult elsewhere. And so African Americans, this is one of the things we need to remember when we talk about the choices that African Americans make. They make those choices within a range of limited options. You know, um, Kansas is not perfect, but it's, better than, it's certainly better than Mississippi or Alabama. And it may well be better than Montana or North Dakota or a whole host of other places. And so, so people migrate to the place that offers the greatest amount of opportunity at that moment. One of the things I'm grappling with, you know, we're, we're working on a new book, uh, my, probably my last book, Bill, with uh, a new book on the history of black communities all over the West, or the major black. We're not going to talk about Topeka, unfortunately, but, but the major black community, although they, there's a fascinating study. Uh, as a matter of fact, I've got my graduate students reading uh, about Topeka this week, in fact, and I need to read that myself. But, uh, but uh, there, there are all these communities all over the West, and black folks came in the 18, urban communities, and black folks came in the 1880s and 1890s. They continued to come through the World War II years. They continued to come up until the 1960s. And then immigration or migration to these cities tapered off. Why did it taper off? It tapered off in part uh, because black folks began to realize that the West wasn't that area of freedom, wasn't that bastion of freedom that they had imagined before. It also tapered off, quite frankly, because the opportunities in the South or elsewhere got better. And so people are making choices. Like somebody raised the I think you raised the question before about blacks leaving Kansas. One of the reasons they, they leave Kansas is indeed very similar to the reason they come. They come to Kansas because they want freedom, they want opportunity, and they may end up leaving Kansas for the same reason, because they feel that they can get more freedom, more opportunity, and particularly opportunity somewhere else. I mean, could Gordon Parks have been Gordon Parks had he stayed in Kansas? Could Langston Hughes have been Langston Hughes that he stayed in Kansas? And this is not, you know, this is the reality. I mean, I, any, any artist, uh, any artist of any stature would more than likely have to leave Kansas. And, I, and this is not a slight on Kansas. Look at the folks who grew up in Brownsville. I mean, Tina Turner grew up in Brownsville. She's not in Brownsville now. <laughs> okay, <laughs> okay. So, so, no, thank you. So, so yeah, there, there is this idea uh, that you go to the place that's best at the moment, and future generations may realize that someplace else is best. Thank you, Quintard. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.